Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, our guest here and online. Uh, my name is Khaldun Azhari. I am a correspondent uh, here, and uh, I was former president, and I have the honor to moderate this uh, press conference. Our guest speakers today, uh, from my uh, very right, is Mr. Michael Tungs. He is head of policy and public affairs, Internet Watch Foundation. And to his right is Ms. Susie Hargreaves, and uh, she is CEO of the Internet Watch Foundation. And to her uh, right is Mr. Kas Katsuhiko uh, Takeda. He is uh, Executive Director of uh, Child Fund uh, Japan. And the uh, topic today is about uh, countering the AI threat of child abuse uh, images, which uh, is kind of spread uh, online. And uh, it caused a lot of uh, worrisome among uh, parents, among the society. And uh, it's great we have such uh, uh, guards uh, online and uh, in the society to uh, make sure that this doesn't uh, spread more and it, the government maybe or the organization, civil organizations put uh, uh, an end and or uh, try to watch uh, this uh, kind of uh, activities. Uh, our speakers today will speak for 10 minutes each and that will be followed by uh, Q&A. Uh, without uh, further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we will start our press conference. Please start as you like. Who is first? Thank you. Um, Aligata Gozaimas, Konnichiwa. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Susie Hargreaves, and I am the Chief Executive of the Internet Watch Foundation, which is based in the UK and which is an international hotline with a mission to eliminate online child sexual abuse. Uh, it's a real honor to be here to talk about our work and in particular we're going to focus on the current trend of generative AI produced child sexual abuse. But just to give you a little context before we talk specifically about that, I would also like to thank Child Fund who were responsible for inviting us over to Japan and um, without their support, we wouldn't be here today, so thank you. So the IWF, the Internet Watch Foundation, is called the IWF in the UK, and um, we have been in existence for 26 years, and our job is to find and remove online child sexual abuse. And we work with the internet industry to provide them with data and technical tools to help them disrupt and prevent the distribution of child sexual abuse imagery. We also have the ability to go out and find this imagery ourselves, and we use technology to do that. So we're a technology company. And before we talk about AI, last year, in 2023, we removed 275,000 web pages of child sexual abuse, and each web page could have one or 100 or even thousands of images. So we removed millions and millions of images and videos last year. Um, all the information about the organization is on iwf.org.uk if you want to know more about the general picture of what we're removing. But today, the focus is very much on AI-generated content. And um, I want to talk about what it is and how we find it and why that's such a big problem. So. Um, about six months ago, maybe a little bit longer, we started seeing this new material when we were searching the internet. And we realized we've got a major problem coming down the line. So why is it a problem, artificially, uh, you know, AI-generated uh, content? Why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem for lots and lots of reasons. So we are seeing existing children who are having their images manipulated and made into child sexual abuse images, children who've never been sexually abused, being nudified, children who have been sexually abused, being further abused by the making of more images of them, um, children of, who are famous having their images manipulated, and also adults who are famous being manipulated to abuse children. But also we're seeing completely artificially generated images as well. And we're going to show you how some of those are made. 
And uh, this is really important for lots of reasons because by looking at this content, it normalises people's behaviour, that it's okay to look at child sexual abuse, which it isn't. And uh, it, it puts further suffering on existing victims. It also causes huge problems for law enforcement who are potentially going after children who don't exist and wasting resource and therefore not rescuing children who are really being sexually abused. So on lots and lots of levels, it's a huge problem. So let's just get into it now and talk about what, we're, what it is we're uh, seeing. So, um, uh, right. so let me tell you about a little, little um, project we did last year. So we decided to just spend one month looking at just one dark web forum. So one of our analysts spent the day, looking the month, looking at one dark forum, and they found 20,000 images that they felt needed further investigation. Uh, of these, 11,000 looked as if they could be child sexual abuse. So in the UK, because it's illegal in the UK, our AI-generated images, we're able to look at them and assess them under UK law and get them removed. So we had a look at them and said, right, OK, 11,000 of those look like child sexual abuse. We're really going to dig down and see if they are. Now, of them, 2,562 were assessed as being criminal images. And 416 of them were also, um, uh, they were criminally prohibited images as well. So we found a number of illegal images and we were able to get them removed. So what do they look like? What are we actually talking about? Let's show you some of this. So this is an example of what we would call a non-actionable image. So these are images of children in the UK where um, these are artificially generated, AI-generated images, but these are not illegal images. So the one on the far left is a, is a girl that you can see um, that Im you might think that's a bit inappropriate, but that's not something that we would action. So for the, thus, that's just an image that we just look at and say, no, that's, that's, that's a, not an illegal image. We won't take action on that. Let me just move on a bit further. Oh, we also seen in certain images, we can tell if they're AI images because the AI still is not so sophisticated that we can say, oh, it's definitely a real child or not. Or, it, you know, so if you look at this, you'll find some subtle deformities and tells within the images. So the top image, the, there's a, we've circled the areas that look wrong for us. So our analysts are looking all the time for clues and tells to see, is this a real image, is this an AI image? And this is really important. And this is another reason why it's problematic for us, because we have about 35 analysts, and if they're spending their whole time looking at AI images or having to spend a long time looking at images to see if they are AI generated, it takes them away from finding real children. So you can see there there's too many toes on one of those. Um, there are problems with the numbers of fingers. We look at different kind of tells so we can see if they're real. But have a look at these ones. These are all AI generated images. So these are not real children, they are AI generated. And it, it's pretty difficult, isn't it, to tell whether they're real or not. So um, this is how sophisticated the uh, software is getting now, that people can actually create really realistic images. So how do they make these images? Let's just talk a bit about that. So um, how do you create them? Well, the first thing that's very worrying about this is anybody can create them. You don't have to be a specialist. Anybody can create them because the tools are openly available to anyone to create these. And they're op openly available as open source software. So the most common one that we see being used is Stable Diffusion or in closed cloud um, software as well. But mostly we're seeing it in terms of open source. And what it, this open source software does is accepts positive prompts. So people type in words of what they want to see, and then it pulls from a massive, massive database of images and pulls every, all that information in and then generates an image. And each time you press regenerate, it will kind of double up on that information so it becomes more and more accurate. 
Um, so perpetrators will um, type in all the things they want to see, they'll type in what they don't want to see, and what will come out, churned at the other end, is an image. It's trained on enormous data, data sets of real images. So the real imagery will include real children, which will then make its way into an AI image. So real children are at the heart of this. And um, you know what we're trying to do is uh, people will find that they will use different models and uh, they will also uh, include, and Mike will talk a bit more about what the add-ons are that people can actually add on to make it even more realistic. So my last slide shows you an actual prompt and a result. So these are the prompts that are put in. So this, this is an image that came out of those prompts on the right. So some of this is really distasteful, I have to say. It's distasteful anyway, but people put in very negative, terrible prompts about children as well, what they don't want to see. So um, they will put in what they want to see, and then they'll put in some horrible terms about what they don't want to see as well. And those two images on the left are AI generated image of those girls that they wanted to see. So you'll see that they say positive, that they want to see certain types of children, or t these, these are we put in older people. And then underneath you'll see the text that says what they don't want to see. Um, and this can be done all the time. And people do it, they will put in prompts like, I want to see a cat sat on a road with a banana on its head. And you know, you'll get a picture of a cat and all that kind of stuff. But of course, if you think about it, it can then be used very negatively. So over to you, Mike, now, please. Thanks, Susie. So um, part of my job at the Internet Watch Foundation is to uh, look at how we change regulation globally and um, improve the, re the response to um, future emerging um, technologies. And I would say that this isn't an emerging technology. This is a here and now um, problem. And as Susie mentioned, there's um, two principal approaches to... Uh, to, to AI-generated text-to-image-based um, models. So one is a closed-source model, um, and this is where the technology company developing the solution keeps the code secret, essentially. It is in control of the model itself, and it can build in safeguards into that model. So that's possible. Uh, and as Susie was explaining, the danger that we see more in, in relation to our work is open-source technology. This is technology that's released to supposedly the open source community, but in reality means anybody online accessing this technology. It's released to anybody, it's available to anyone to, to, to build on and improve and so-called improve the technology. But as we're seeing, it can be abused as well. So they can be easily manipulated, they can be uh, placed on offenders' devices anonymously, and safeguards can be removed, um, such as watermarking is a current real live um, policy debate in this area. Um, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how the models themselves are built. So you, as Susie said, you have um, a foundational model which is built on billions of uh, images that have been um, tagged and labelled from the internet. And that within those data sets, they can contain real images of children that have been sexually abused. So it is not. So the generation of AI-generated CSAM is far from being a victimless crime. The, the creation of these images are often built on the real images of children that are contained either within the foundational model itself or, more concerningly, within what we call fine-tuning and refined models. So um, just on the way in here, we were having a discussion about how Taylor Swift's images have recently been abused, for example. This gives people, anybody out there on the internet, the opportunity to create exactly what they want. So if they want to see an image of Ch Taylor Swift um, uh, y you know, uh, being involved in these images, they can create a bank of images and plug that into the foundational model. You can also do that with child sexual abuse images. So you want to see more child sexual abuse images, more extreme child sexual abuse images. By building a LoRa or a checkpoint and adding it into the foundational model, you can refine the AI-generated CSAM that you want. So the really dark reality of this technology means that people can use it to create whatever fantasy or whatever thing they want to do to children, and it's in incredibly um, dangerous. Um, and then again, I just want to move on to how um, offenders can 
further manipulate the imagery. So I've spoken about foundational models that can contain it. I've spoken about add-ons, LoRa's and checkpoint files. But then there are also three other types um, of image editing software that can be used to correct the current deformities that there are within the um, AI-generated uh, CSAM. One of them is in-painting, and that allows the offender to correct physical deformity so it enables them to create more realistic fingers for example some of the images that you saw at the start where um, you know there were too many fingers for example in painting is something that helps them to further refine that open pose so we're seeing this a lot um, in terms of people being photoshopped into different sexual positions is being used in, used in sort of some of the nudifying technology that we're seeing in this space at the moment and then roop also enables the face swapping of individuals and this is being used to particularly create deep fakes of celebrities um, abusing children um, as well and then finally i just wanted to come on to um, some challenges and recommendations so uh Towards the end of last year, the UK government hosted an AI safety summit, an international AI safety summit at Bletchley Park um, in the UK. And in the fringes of that, we co-hosted with the UK Home Office, uh, UK Home Office, a, um, a, a side event where 33 uh, NGOs, uh, tech companies, and academics signed up, um, and, and government signed up to a joint pledge to tackle child sexual abuse and exploitation. So I think one of my recommendations would be it would be great if we could see the Japanese government also signing on to that and Japanese law enforcement as a result of our visit um, here today. But there are some further recommendations that we've been discussing as well. The first one relates to paedophile manuals. These are manuals that are created to um, direct people on how to abuse children. There are manuals now being created and shared online about how to use generative AI technology to also mm -hmm. abuse and exploit children. These are currently not illegal in many places um, around the world, including the UK. Secondly, there are differences with how we treat um, non-photographic images or pseudo-images of children um, internationally versus real imagery. And as I've just explained, these are very closely linked and intertwined. So there needs to be um, a better collaboration around that. Thirdly, we need better training for law enforcement on AI images because there is going to be a real challenge for law enforcement in identifying the difference between real children, children that um, aren't real, and then there is even a mixed economy within some of that that we're beginning to see as well. Fourthly, there's a lack of regulatory oversight around um, AI models. And then finally, we're going to need um, in effective engagement with academic communities um, to ensure that we're designing technology um, in the safe safe as possible way as well. And then finally, um, we're also seeing the, the AI is also being used to create chatbots which encourage people to abuse children as well. And there are massive gaps in the law around um, the use, design, and distribution of those technologies as well. Um, and, and that's it for me, so I will, I will hand over to Katz. Thank you so much So such a wonderful conference, conf uh, press conference for us. So we wanted to uh, share that kind of a new trend of this generative AI in the world and the UK. So we want to introduce to Japan. So that's why we invited the IWDF to Japan. So my name is Katz Takeda, is the executive director of Child Fund. It's a Child Fund is a, a child focus agencies for the international NGOs. We are working in the globally, especially the Child Fund Japan is working in Asia. 
So from our perspective, so we are more of commitment to end violence against children, especially the online safety, especially online sexual exploitation of children. So that's why we are working hard on the advocacy of the online safe sexual exploitation of children for these years. So now is, uh, here is our presentation is is that this is a background. Why we invited Ch uh, Internet Watch Foundation to Japan? So last year, so we conducted is opinion poll, uh, opinion poll about the, we are asking the people in Japan uh, what's going on in the child pornography. So many of the uh, respondent respondents said is. Uh, here is about 70% of the response answered, we should regulate as a generative AI on child pornography. So this is one of the evidence we started for working on how we can regulate as a generative AI in Japan. So then, uh, so many articles around the world about on this generative AI, but on the other hand, in Japan, we do, we do have not so many media coverage on the risk of generative AI. So we need to more promote about the risk of generative AI in Japan. So, so that's why so here is a thank you for coming to the co press conference from some of the medias in Japan. And here is the uh, uh, challenges of the legal framework of in Japan. So right now is a we have two laws regulate is a generative is a kind of a child pornography in Japan. Is one of its is a child pornography law, and also the criminal law is um, partially is a regulate in the child pornography. Is but right now is a, our law, especially the child pornography law, is focusing on the real children, the real image of uh, child pornography. That's it. But some other countries like UK and some other countries, they are including, expanding the scope of the definitions, including the pseudo image and also the virtual images. But uh, in Japan and some other countries, they have some uh, conflict of the how to say, discussion between child rights and also freedom of expression. So it's, a, it's quite a long time we debate between the two rights on this one. But this phase is a, we, are new we are facing a new development of the generative AI issues. So probably in our opinion, so we should how say, get away from the hard discussion of two ra uh, human rights. Probably we focus on the generative AI only. But right now is a generative AI issue is uh, uh, quite different from other aspect like a cartoon, drawing, photo, and videos. So IWFA's colleagues, Susie and Mike already explained as a generative AI product, it's difficult to have say dis distinct or how say this judge is is this a real image or not? It's almost impossible right now and technically. So we are uh, in our face in, in our strategy is we should change some kind of a definition here is uh, in case of generative AI, this is a special case. We need to expand the scope of definition of child pornography law. That is, is uh, the challenges in Japan right now. Then uh, is, this is a le legislation in the England Wales 
is uh, they are uh, having well, it's a more wider scope of definition. Of course, the generative AI contents also are illegal right now. Then according to the laws, is several laws is regulate is a generative AI in UK, uh, in England and Wales. Then already is uh, IWF report is already explained already. So it's uh, so many issues here. And even in the other countries, a dark website is a quite serious issue. In Japan, we don't have it so far. Because right now it's uh, in Japan, so we can easily to get the images from the non-dark website is how it's, uh, this is a quite unique situation and a very strange situation to compare to other countries. So the finally is uh, we recommend to Japanese situations is in the short term and long term. In the short term is probably immediate effect of business sectors to delete the contents uh, generated by generative AI images, that is uh, how say the first response to react these the situation. And also multi-stakeholder dialogue should be established. And right now in Japan is a government initiative dialogue established, but uh, probably that dialogue need more experts from child rights field like some other countries, UK or some others. And also the long-term approach is to amend the child pornography law. This is a, a, the final goal to change the situation drastically. So that's why so we want to know more about the good practice from UK. So that is why we invited to Internet uh, Watch Foundation today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. I would like to open the floor to Q&A. Uh, first in the room, anybody would like to pose any question? OK. I have a few questions online. I will start with a question from Jake Edelson. Uh, he is a journalist in the club. Uh, he asks, if real children are not being harmed, uh, could AI produce children poor in, in fact be, used, be useful uh, in preventing real children in being used to produce these materials? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, there, there are, some people will say, you know what, it doesn't cause any harm to children, it's not real children, and we just categorically refute that. So we, what we actually say is we see real children whose images are being manipulated, we see children who've never been sexually abused having their images nudified, we see um, people who are making these images normalizing abuse of children, so for us, it's not about one replaces the other and it stops children being sexually abused. It still says that this behavior is okay. And from our perspective, it's not okay. So it's not okay to create images of children being sexually abused because that makes it okay and it's never going to be okay. And there are real victims involved. So you cannot say there are no real victims involved. What's the impact of this uh, on the society and uh, families? Sorry. What's the impact of such AI if they use not real children on the societies and on the families? That's a very good question. I mean, would you want to live next door to someone who you knew was creating millions of images of children being sexually abused? Would you feel your family was safe? Would you feel, you know, would you feel that's a good thing for society? that actually we just need to adopt a zero tolerance approach to any images of children being sexually abused. Children are children. They, don't, they shouldn't be engaged in sexual activities. And actually what we want to do is give them a normal childhood. So I don't think on any level it's good for the individual concerned who's doing it, for society as a whole, 
for the potential children Im as images are involved. And, you know, so, you know, I don't think it, it, the argument holds in any way. Thank you. Uh, more questions from here? Okay. Uh, second question, a line from Martin Colling. He's the correspondent of Hans Blank, Hans Blank, the German uh, news uh, paper. What, what are other countries doing uh, in this regard? And what are the legal opinions about the treatment uh, of real uh, photo, video, and non-real child uh, pro pornography uh, contents, like uh, drawing, uh, paintings, computer-generated images, and now AI? In the future, all uh, agents, AI agents, uh, will work on local uh, devices. What challenges does this uh, trend pose? Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, so there, there's a number of things that are happening. I mentioned when I spoke earlier about the UK government's um, international AI safety summit. So the German government was one of the signatories to the joint declaration that came out of that, as were Korean police um, and a number of other governments internationally. So they agreed to that um, international voluntary declaration is the first thing I'd say. Uh, secondly, through the work that we've done, we've seen that... Um, it, we've had a lot of influence in Europe, actually. So uh, the European Commission is looking at reviewing two different laws at the moment. Uh, one is uh, uh, on uh, how to prevent uh, child sexual abuse, and the second are the rules around child sexual abuse. And in that directive review, they've recommended that uh, AI-generated imagery should be, CSAM imagery should be part, child sexual abuse imagery should be part of that new directive review. Um, that's currently out for consultation, and we're hoping that that will become um, a, a law um, in the next couple of months. Um, and also, we are lobbying for changes in the UK around some of the things that I spoke about earlier as well. So paedophile manuals to be expanded to pseudo images and some of the technology um, to be more tightly regulated as well. Thank you. Yeah, please proceed. Uh, so please come, come to the front desk, the front <laughs> You can't hold the mic, please. You can help. Please raise it. Ah, okay. Okay. okay, so thank you for coming to Japan today and so I have one question. Your name and affiliation, ah, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm working at TBS. It's like Tokyo Broadcasting Service Television in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you a question about the current Japanese uh, legal system. So, um, so AI, as um, Takeda-san has presented, so AI-generated child abuse contents are not illegal in Japan right now. But like I heard that UK is setting it's illegal. And like so what do you think about the current legal situation in Japan that is that is setting the uh, child you, abuse content not illegal? Uh, you want me to say? <laughs> okay, so um, f first of all, it's fantastic to be able to be here to have the discussion. You know, that's what's really important is that we all discuss this. It doesn't matter what we do in the UK or uh, what anybody does in any country if all countries don't step up. The internet is a global issue, so we all have to collectively do what we can. And I think, you know, collectively, there isn't a place in the world for children to be sexually abused, so we need to work together. And this is not about stifling technology. This is not about stifling privacy. Technology is good, and actually we use AI in a very positive way as well. But actually, what we need to do is have the legislation and the frameworks to ensure that people cannot create child sexual abuse content. So yes, I would say Japan has to step up and actually look at what the legislation does to cover AI-generated content. So I say that as an outsider with absolute respect, but actually we, c we can't solve it on our own in the UK. We need your help, so we all need to work together. Thank you. I have a question from David McNeil of uh, Irish Times. Mm -hmm. He asked one of the most uh, vexed uh, contemporary debates 
is how and to what extent states should regulate the internet uh, to avoid uh, restricting freedom of expression. Can you give your view on how you would regulate social media in, uh, to prevent abuse? Thank you, yes, and Mike may want to come in on this. So we've just brought in regulation in the UK for online safety. We had an online safety act and we are being, social media companies are being regulated. So they will now, in the past, they had to do things on a voluntary basis. Now they're going to have to uh, be compelled to be transparent, to show what they are doing to keep their platforms clean of child sexual abuse and other harms. It's very much in its infancy, but that's going through. And that seems to be the model that's been looked at around the world. When it comes to the debate about human rights, uh, freedom of expression, privacy, we totally support people's right for privacy. We support people need to have the right to have freedom of expression, but children have rights too. Children have the right not to be sexually abused and they have the right to not have those images shared. No one has the right to do that to them. And it's important because they don't get to sit on this panel and they don't get to speak that we have to speak for them. So for us, it's not a debate about one is good and one is bad. We all have to do what we can to ensure that the internet is regulated in a responsible way which doesn't stifle spe freedom of speech. But at the same time, we need to have safety mechanisms in place because we have lots and lots of safety mechanisms in place offline for children, so we should have them online as well. Mike, did you want to add anything? Yeah, there's just a couple of things I would add. So from a human rights perspective, the right to privacy is a qualified right, and, and therefore, you know, th there are times when privacy has to be in intruded upon for the protection of the public. And clearly the protection of children, some of the most vulnerable people in society, is a pretty good reason, I think, um, you know, for, for that right to be qualified, and it, and it states as, as so in international law. So I think we, need, we, we must re remember that, really. Um, and I'll just conclude my remarks there. Thank you. Just to follow up, I'd like to David's question. You said zero tolerance approach is, is needed, and uh, just uh, Michael said uh, safety mechanism. Do you think there should be severe punishment for those who violate the rules, such as death penalty, for example? Uh, um, I de definitely don't think that the death penalty <laughs> should, because I'm from the UK and we don't agree with the death penalty, so, so I, that, I'm afraid we wouldn't say that. But we do think punishments should be in place. So um, that actually, you know, people, people should be, there are lots of ways to deal with people who deal with who are looking at child sexual abuse. What I would say is I'd rather take it away from the punishments and talk about prevention. So we have such a big issue around people looking at child sexual abuse in the UK um, that um, you can't put them all in prison because we don't have enough space. So actually what we need to do is actually look at how as a society we deal with the issue and what preventative mechanisms can be in place. So it's important we have the debate so people can report to us child sexual abuse, they can report it anonymously and that's one of the fundamental principles of the IWF because we want people to be aware of their behaviour and try and modify and adapt their behaviour before it gets to you know, extreme levels. But at the same time, there are some very nasty, horrible you know, predators out there who commit some very terrible crimes, you know, which include contact abuse of children, and they rightly should be very severely punished. So I think it's important to get the balance on that. Yeah, I was just going to come in, back, just bringing it back to today's discussion around generative AI. I think in the slides that Kat's presented, you have a case there in terms of the impact that that has on, that that has on children. Um, and basically what was happening was children were using, de were using nudifying technology of their classmates and then circulating that on WhatsApp and in, in other social media settings. There was the case mm. in, in Spain around that. And I think actually one of the challenges that we've got is that we're seeing a huge increase in ch child on child uh, uh, abuse as well and the manipulation of technology within that. And I think the challenge is that there is a real education piece that's needed there because I don't think that those children realise that they are creating child sexual abuse images, mm -hmm. which is a criminal offence. Um, what they think they are doing is innocently, 
I, I think they think innocently or not innocently having fun in terms of bullying their, their peers and they see it through that lens rather than actually the severity of the, the, the crime that they're committing. So there is a real education and prevention piece, mm. I agree with Susie, that, that is really needed there, particularly with children. Thank you. More questions? Yes, please. I'm Emil Connor from Nippon Television. So you talked about normalization, right? Yeah. And I feel like normalization and prevention is very tied in because if it once it's normalized, you can't quite prevent from people thinking that it's a, on, an odd thing. And in Japan, there's we have this um, almost stigma where um, there's such the thing as junior and child idols, where um, really young girls will go on stage and perform music and mostly middle-aged to older men will watch them and they'll be a fan of them. And the society will look at them as maybe slightly odd taste, mm -hmm. but it's not quite restricted. So I wanted to get, and their photos are online everywhere. They have group chats, um, open chats about these young girls performing and in a very sexual kind of angled camera and things like that. So I was wondering, um, because the real reality is very much connected to what's happening on the, in the digital world. If you think this kind of child idol, they should be restricted as well. What ages? Ages. Um, they're around elementary school ages, I would say. So, yeah, what, younger what than 12. What age, sorry? Younger than 12 years old. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I can provide an, an answer in terms of the context of what the UK government has, has recently done through the Online Safety Act. So we've spoken um, a lot about how that act is being watched internationally. Uh, that has actually broadened the scope slightly of, of child sexual abuse. Um, so look, child sexual abuse and exploitation has to be removed. It's illegal, yeah. clearly. But where there are challenges are what you're talking about, which is stuff that doesn't quite meet, which is content that doesn't quite meet the threshold. And then, of course, people are commenting on those, those uh, whatever those images may be. Now, the Online Safety Act actually views that now as priority category content and directs companies to remove it or certainly moderate it in, in, in some way. So I think that that is the right approach that, that we need to be taking. That Basically what the Online Safety Act is doing is saying to companies, you need to design your platforms safely. You have to have systems and processes in place to moderate this content. And that is something that is gonna be dealt with through, through the Act as well. So I think it's really important that, yes, it might not be it might not be criminal, but if it's on the way to criminality or is exposing that in, in, in some way, it is just as damaging to society. What we see is a, an offender pathway to getting there. And uh, that does have very damaging consequences. And under the Act, they will be quite required to t tackle it as priori priority category content. So I guess in answer to your question, there's further to go. Further to, to go. But through the regulation that we've got in the UK, I'm hoping that that will be an exemplar to the world um, and we can see changes through that. Thanks. I have a question from uh, online from Dennis Normail of the Science Magazine. He asks, uh, is more of this material produced and or viewed in Japan than uh, in other countries? Is there more of that in Japan than other countries? And if so, why? Um, I mean, I could ask, ask Katz about it. I mean, the reality is we don't know who views content. People, we don't know until people get caught or, you know, so we know where content is, we can find where it's hosted. Um, they do some work in, uh, we can find out how often images are shared sometimes. But the reality is we don't know how many people in how many countries are looking at content. What I can say is I doubt, you know, that your people in Japan are that much different to people in the UK or any other country. We know people are looking at it. But we can't give any definitive numbers in that respect of how many people are looking at any one time. I don't know what, Katz, what you can add to that? Yeah, maybe you, you should see their IWF report. They mentioned about uh, a stable diffusion, diffusions case is uh, one, of the, one of the cases in Japan. So as one country is a week of regulations, 
maybe that is, uh, how to say, the target of, of the perpetrators. And also this image will spread out mm -hmm. everywhere, globally, internationally, some other countries. The victim is uh, emphasized or expanded to some other countries. So this is, uh, how to say, do harm to the child rights. So is, uh, we need to more have to develop as a foundation of the, some of the minimum standard of the regulation. Otherwise, it's difficult to manage the, how to say, the control the regulation globally. Thank you. Yes, more questions? All right, other questions online? We have a pretty good okay, so. number of questions online. Uh, this question is from uh, Reuters News, um, uh, our colleague uh, Rocky Swift. Mm -hmm. He asks, some uh, manga or anime portray uh, mostly human characters mm -hmm. with a slight animal aspect, like having um, cat ears or fangs of ta or tail, etc. Is there some inten intentionality, intentional, uh, intentionality here? And if the character isn't exactly human, is there uh, more you can get away with, uh, with in terms of sexual imaginary and uh, content? Like they are trying to show it, they are not human; they are mm. some creatures, so they can get away with the you know image. It's not the children. I mean, what, one of the things we're, we're hoping to learn more about while we're in Japan is manga and the, that whole area, because that's not the phenomena in the UK as it is in Japan. But certainly, uh, bestiality uh, is, a, is illegal in terms of our images that we take action on in the UK. So we, we would, it would fall foul of our legislation in terms of if, if it's a sort of mix of a child, if it's a manga type image with a mix of a child and an animal, that will find full foul and we will take action as an illegal image. But um, Mike, perhaps you would like to add something here. Yeah, I, I think what, what Susie said is right. It would be covered under a different piece of law in the UK. So it would be covered under the Obscene Publications uh, Act. But yes, it would be illegal content and um, under the terms of our Online Safety Act law. Uh, companies would be required to remove it. So, um, yeah, there really is there really is no difference. I guess it just depends under what law you would re remove it. But yeah, companies should be removing it. Right. Other question from uh, Elgen Yormas uh, from uh, BBT Turkish. She asked: Different countries have different laws mm -hmm. and regulations when it comes to uh, online child pornography. How should the discussion uh, on AI be uh, guided to actually make it a universal rule to prevent this uh, crime? And what role can the UN play in it, United Nations? Yeah, so the first thing that I would say is that obviously the, the sort of terminology around child pornography is, is, is the first thing that needs to be challenged. Um, so universally now it's referred to as child sexual abuse material because the term child pornography places an element of blame on the on the child um, it, and that should never be the case this stuff is this content is illegal um, and should be uh, discussed respectfully so child sexual abuse material is the is the first term that I would like to see sort of universally um, adopted of course as Susie's spoken already there's there's um, there's a great need for international collaboration um, in this space whether that's through the UN or other agencies um, you know, voluntary declarations like the UK's AI Safety Summit um, is also really important here. Uh, what we're doing today, I think, is also equally important as well because um, as child protection charities, as, as governments, we all need to work together to, to solve this. So whether that's through the UN or, or other uh, forums, um, we, we need to work with them. I think the EU's ahead in some respects. The EU's already passed. Um, an AI Act. I think we're going to be lobbying our UK government to pass legislation in this space or certainly improve and tighten up the legislation. And we need um, organisations all around the world to be, to be lobbying for how to regulate this. I think there are real challenges around particularly open source regulation of AI technology, but that's not to say that it's not impossible. We can build things in like watermarking, um, and, and there is much more that they can be doing to make sure that the technology is safe before it's released to uh, academic communities or, as we would say, you know, the whole world. 
Can I just add to that that um, the We Protect Global Alliance was developed exactly to try and uh, standardise the way different countries approach online child sexual abuse and exploitation. And they developed, it's, it was it, it were initiated in the UK, but it's now uh, a partnership of over 50 countries, and Japan's involved in it, um, where one of the f key things that was developed in the first instance was a, what's called the Model National Response, which is a framework which says, you know, to really have, you know, kind of a gold star approach to fighting child sexual abuse, you need to have all these building blocks in place. But, you know what, there's some fundamental ones you need to have, which are basic legislation, basic law enforcement, basic not victim blaming, you know, things like that. So actually it's a way in to try and bring us all up to the same level, because we're not perfect in the UK. There are other countries that do things better than us. So we no need to work together to try and bring it up to a certain level. And one of the things we do as part of that is that uh, one of the fundamental building blocks is that each country needs somewhere to report child sexual abuse. And we, we now provide 52 reporting portals in 52 countries so that who don't have a hotline like us so that people can actually report suspected child sexual abuse and we can get that removed. But it, the whole concept and its partnership, not just of countries, but there's an industry partnership and there's an NGO partnership, is that we all, we all have the same ultimate aim but we recognize that legislation is different in different countries and the way and cultural sensitivities and we're all slightly different. But if we can all just sort of push together and build together, we can find a way to build in a, a, a zero tolerance approach to it across the world. Thank you. <coughs> we still have some little time. If you have any question on the floor, please raise your hand and uh, just proceed. All right, uh, maybe I should has some question. Oh. There is, you know, adult porno. Mm -hmm. uh, so why targeting only the child porno? Also, adult porno has some negatives in some countries, uh, in some opinions, and in some countries, actually, people might be arrested yeah. uh, on the borders if somebody saw in their phone porno or something, and not to mention inside the country. So. Uh, the discussion, like your point, make it feel, make us feel that adult porno is okay, but child porno is not. <laughs> I'm sorry, but do you think it's also it should be targeted uh, adult porno? I think I think that's a really good question, and it is very true that different countries have a different approach to adult pornography and adult content. Like we, we you know, we are from different countries, and in the UK, uh, pornography is legal. So legal, not illegal, it's legal. I mean, there are some restrictions around the type of pornography you can have. You know, there are some things that are not legal within pornographic content, you know, obscene adult content. There is, you know, so there is a kind of framework for that. You can't do anything, you know, but it is legal. And in many other countries it's legal, but in some countries it's totally illegal. And I think, I think we're going to have a difference of opinion about that. But I think when it comes to child sexual abuse, the reason we try and separate out not calling it pornography is because it legitimizes what is abuse. And actually children are not adults. So adults have the ability to make decisions around their own behavior. Now some countries might not agree with that. And personally, you know, some people might not agree with that. But actually children don't. And children need to be protected. And in exactly the same ways, I'm allowed to drive a car and I'm allowed to drink alcohol, but my two-year-old grandson isn't, and that's for a very good reason. So I think it's, we have lots and lots of rules about what adults can do, and we have lots and lots of rules about what children can't do, and I think we just need to apply them fairly. But the reality is child sexual abuse is pretty much something that everybody across the world agrees upon, that actually, you know, Children have a right to a childhood, and I think wherever you live in whatever country, I think we'd all buy into that. Thank you. Just we have four, five more minutes. If you have some uh, advice on, on this to the uh, governments, Caps, did you want to? I think the reference to the United Nations is very important. Thank it's you. a good point. If United Nations lead the way in this kind of 
act that would give it more, you know, voice. In the yeah, yeah, I would. Yes, I would say that I think it's everybody's responsibility. So um, I don't think you need to wait for sort of bad, catastrophic, tragic events to happen before everybody in the, has a national debate about this. Unfortunately. And I say this for someone who's been working in this field for a long time. Unfortunately, this is a problem that's growing around the world. As more people get online, new platforms, new ways of sharing it, however good we are at trying to fight the problem, it, you know, it is a battle. So it's really important that we don't pretend it's... Well, it's really important that we, that we acknowledge this happens and that we engage in public debates about it. And the only way we're really really deal with it is to ensure that we have three pillars to fight it. One is, one is government and law enforcement, really big responsibility. One is technology. Technology companies have a huge responsibility in this respect. And we have a responsibility about the way we use technology. And technology can be used for good to fight this problem. But the third is about a societal responsibility. It's about education and awareness. It's about prevention. And that's about all of us stepping up, and all of us, not saying it's the government's responsibility or it's law enforcement's responsibility, it's all of our responsibility. So I think, and that, that doesn't matter what country you're in, so we all need to not be scared to have the debate, and we need to talk to our children who are using the internet and make sure we do everything we can to keep them safe online. Last, last uh, memo. Since that we are in Japan, there are some rules in Japan, not on, uh, on pornography. For example, uh, if you want to take photo uh, mm -hmm. using your iPhone, it, it must click. You cannot hide the click. So everybody will hear it. So they know you are filming. That's good. Yeah, so it's in, in the phone set up. You cannot take it out, basically. Also in the cars in yeah. Japan, uh, if you don't put the seat belt, it keeps beeping. You know? Yeah, same. And yeah. Uh, I went to uh, my car dealer. I said, please remove it. He said, no, I cannot do that by law. So do you think that the, the internet companies or the iPhone companies, I mean mobile phone companies, should, should be part of the solution of the preventing uh, technology method that when there is some you know, uh, AI thing or AI production uh, for children, or I don't know how to do it for children, the telephone must you know, stop or must do something. I'm sure technology can do that, but do you think that would be a good solution? I think technology companies absolutely have to look at everything they can do to use innovation and use technology in a good way and whether it's about you know uh, you know if you know blanking out nudes f images if it's about uh, parental filters if it's about you know we 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 uh, deliver um, every time we make find a legal image we hash it we put a digital fingerprint on it we have about two and a half million unique images on our list at the moment that goes out across the world, and the major internet companies use it to scan their platforms to make sure duplicate images aren't loaded. So we look at lots and lots of ways to use technology, and I absolutely, there's an interesting debate at the moment about whether you know scanning can be done on device level, if it's not done on platform level. There are lots and lots of mechanisms that can be put in place to make uh, the internet safer for children, and I think internet companies should be doing everything they can uh, Mike, did you want to add to that? I was just going to say, it's a, almost a perfect analogy it about seat, seat belts and cars. Yeah. Um, you know, because years and years ago when cars were designed, everybody went, isn't that fantastic? You know, we can all drive down the road in a vehicle and get to, from A to B much quicker than we would in a horse and car, right? But when they initially did it, they didn't do it safely, you know? And then someone in the 70s went, this is really dumb. Loads of people are dying in accidents, you know? And we're kind of in this, at the same point yeah. that we are with social media at the moment. Everybody's gone, isn't it great? I can share my life on social media. Um, but we haven't really thought about the seatbelts for social media or AI yet, um, and we're going to need to. So I think you know there will always be a need for um, safety to keep a pace with technology, but I think the way you frame the question is absolutely perfect in, in terms of the analogy between cars and seatbelts and where we are with social media at the moment. I couldn't have said it better. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Takeda-san yeah. is from Japan and uh, the country <laughs> of rules. So <laughs> Yes. Is uh, today we talk about a lot about the uh, risk of g generative AI, but we do not forget about the opportunity of a generative mm -hmm. AI. So this is, uh, a ha I think, a hope of the solution in the future by business sector and some others. So probably in the future, so generative AI will prevent such kind of risk. Uh, we hope. Thank you.
special okay. question yeah, for the point. Because we're all going to be reporting about this today, we want to, um, I would like to know about uh, any other vocabularies that we need to be careful about. So you said, you know, we shouldn't call it child pornography, but say it child abuse materials. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, points that you like to point out? I can't think of any off the top of my head. I, th I think I think the child pornography one is is the big one for us, and I think that you know it's called CP in some countries, and legislation is linked to child pornography. And but you know I think there has been this sort of whole movement towards away from that to child sexual abuse and exploitation. Uh, you know, just just to focus on it being abuse as opposed to pornography. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I think this wraps up our event today. I think you gave very uh, noble cause for, for this issue. And I hope uh, we are all actually, uh, you know, have to do something about it. It's not only your uh, agency or your uh, government. So uh, I hope you come again in the future with some good news about <laughs> it. And uh, today you are most welcome to join us in the for more discussion in the bar in the press club here. Thank, thank you, you everybody for coming, everybody online, thank you again, and have a nice evening. Thank Please you, thank you, Mr. Sari. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.